problem. Um, so thank you for inviting me, um, and thank you to the Mome Tech Lab for inviting me, and to Reka for helping coordinate the event. Um, uh, first, I'd like to begin, now that you know a little bit about me, um, I was hoping to sort of get to know who's here um, and what your involvements in the arts or digital humanities are. Um, so um, by a show of hands, how many people here are artists or art students? Um, teachers? Uh, professionals who work in a museum or archive or gallery? Okay. Great. Um, that's really good to know. And I think, and there's actually, I think there's a there's a role um, and there's a sort of application for each one of those stages. Um, am I talking loud enough? No. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I will try to yell. Um, uh, before I get to the slideshow, I also just want to sort of throw out a question about um, what what are the digital humanities? Um, and within that question, um, also some, some sub-questions would be, who does the digital humanities? Um, and do digital humanities equally apply to contemporary and historical research about art? Um, and if, everyone, if anyone would like to volunteer um, an answer or thoughts or, or responses to those questions, then we'll save them for the end. Um, so, um, as Professor Rokai said, um, I was recently the cataloger and the assistant digital content strategist um, of the Thomas Walter Collection at MoMA. Um, and the Thomas Walter Collection includes 341 photographs of uh, representing modernism between the wars um, and the first half of the 20th century. It includes um, masterpieces by really well-known artists, including Edward Weston, Alfred Stieglitz, um, Lazo Maholi Naj, Andre Kertes, Alexander Rochenko, um, as well as as well as some lesser known artists who hopefully that status will also change. Um, artists hail artists in the collection hail from Hungary, France, the United States, Germany, Buenos, uh, Argentina, Mexico, Hungary, Poland, um, to name just a few. And the collection represents some of the transatlantic and international networks um, that made up uh, photographic modernism between the wars. The Walter Collection Project was a four-year research project, a collaboration between um, two departments at the museum, the Department of Conservation and the Department of Photographs. And it included the participation of about 30 invited scholars who came for one to two week long residencies um, to research subsets of the collection in depth. And when they came, they would also look at, um, they would meet with the conservators so that historians were exchanging, informations with, were exchanging information with scientists um, to come to a new sort of merger of historical and material analysis. Uh, the pictures here on the screen are some of the photographs that were made in Budapest. Um, and one of the invited scholars was the director of the Hungarian Museum of Photography Peter Baki, who came to research these and photographs that were in the Hungarian Illustrated Press. In December, um, in mid-December, we simultaneously launched the website Object Photo, the book um, by the same name, which you see up there in the top left. Um, it's a hefty 400-page volume with plates and extended essays and some cataloging, um, and also an exhibition of most of the prints in the Walter Collection. Um, here, there are two installation photos. Um, I, can, I can explain these a little. Um, one of, up here we have uh, two photographs by Alexander Rochenko, um, and then below it are seven uh, issues of Sovetsko Photo, um, which was a publication that he was printing in or sending images to during this period. Um, and down here we have these 14 images are by Willy Ruga, um, a German photographer, and there are actually a really fascinating um, series that I recommend looking at um, on the website. It's a series of him um, going up into an airplane and jumping out by parachute, which was um, a new and novel thing to do at the time, and he, he documented it all himself with a camera. And then here um, is, a, is a, an original newspaper from the era in which these photographs were printed and it shows you the design and layout that the series went into eventually. So one of the main emphasis of the collection was on showing how photographs that were um, taken were eventually shaped into uh, contributions to illustrated press and to exhibitions and trying to pick out how photographers would have, um, uh, which techniques or materials they would have applied um, depending on where the photograph was ultimately destined for, a magazine or an exhibition.
For the Object Photo website, we wanted to use digital tools to present a collection in a way that took advantage of having a digital medium that would be very different than a book in an exhibition. Um, the advantage of the web, namely for us, began with having multiple perspectives on the same collection, on the same relatively small collection of 341 photographs to apply different ways of looking at it and seeing if in different contexts and different media you would sort of find different results or draw different conclusions about the same set of um, photographs, representations of modernism. In the fall of 2013, we began working with Second Story Studios, um, which is based in Portland, Oregon, and they're known for um, really doing a good job of uh, applying a narrative and creating relationships out of complex, set of data, complex sets of data. Uh, to begin with that, um, to begin with that process, we started by trying to understand all, trying to get a clear picture of all of the content we had, which, as I mentioned, was gathered over four years and over collaborations with not just the 30 invited scholars, but with hundreds of um, con contributors in various ways. Uh, so this is, a, this is a very early sketch of, a very early sketch that I drew just trying to understand what bodies of information we had um, and how they fit together. And, I know you can't really see the text because it's actually a huge, it's a huge image and, and this sort of represents some of the quantity of, of information and research that we had. And over here on the, these two blocks in black represent the artist data and the object data, um, which are considered the sort of building blocks of this website, that all of the visualizations, all of the detailed pages sort of come from the data that is, that is housed primarily in those two sets of detail pages. And then over here on the right um, are, was my sort of initial way of trying to understand what we, what we internally were calling the matrix, um, but it's not really a term that we use on the website. Um, but it's, it's essentially a set of influential exhibitions, publications, cities, um, and schools that photographers were gathering in during this time period, that they were meeting one another and exchanging ideas. And so um, the curators developed a number of, they, they selected and identified a number of um, these nodes to be um, in this matrix, and those are sort of represented on this side. So eventually, as I said, this is a very preliminary sketch on my part, um, but eventually we created links between each of these bubbles um, so that you could, start, you could start over here with a magazine and somehow link through a school to um, information about an object, to information about an artist, or back the other way and around. And going back two slides, <clears throat> um, taking a step back from that network visualization, or the sort of preliminary network visualization, um, the most important, the, mo the premise of the Walter project is to return the focus of photography research back to the actual object itself. Um, the premise is that the, the material objects that, are, that we create or that are housed in museum collections are the primary source for information. Um, too often, um, images are shared online or printed in books as just, as just a cropped image, completely without its borders, without any sign of its sort of material presence. Um, we wanted to change that to show that a photograph that could be presented like this in a book actually as a real material object looks like this in a collection. Um, and so for this instance of John Hines' print, um, you can see here that the, your sense of geometry and scale um, and what's being presented here completely changes when you view it as this small object, object set into a much larger amount. And here, um, I will take you to the website. So as I mentioned, the, the premise of the whole project, the, the foundation of it um, and the building blocks are these object pages um, for which the majority of data is gathered. And we begin with, I'll take you first to um, Oscar Nierlinger's Motorcycle in the Race, um, because this is a particularly good example of the information that you can pull out of researching an object itself. The, this is an example of one of the object pages. It's a, it's a five to six page, uh, five to six tab page, depending on exactly which object. 
Um, and it's designed to take you through the photograph from the surface, the front, the recto, um, to the back, and then into the photograph, into the paper material and its actual chemical components. So we begin with um, a high resolution um, expandable image of the verso, oh, I'm sorry, of the recto. And it takes you as well to every, every verso in the collection is also digitized in high resolution, which is really rare for photography research and presentation. But um, just to sort of give you an idea of what, what can actually be gleaned from the verso, um, in this particular instance, this print, um, Oscar Nerlinger's Motorcycle in the Race, we determined was, part, was the actual physical print that was hanging on the walls of the very influential film and photo exhibition of 1929. Um, and we did this because uh, visiting scholar Olivier Lugan was able to match uh, here at the bottom this sticker that says 555. He was able to match that to the catalog entry um, in the original catalog, which is not illustrated, but 555 is connected to Nerlinger's name and to a work by the same title. So that was the first indication that this might be the one that hung in the exhibition. But then looking at the verso as well, by this Japanese import stamp here, he knew that this was the actual print that traveled with the exhibition, and it got the stamp because the exhibition traveled to Japan as well. If, we look at, if, we, if we're able to know that this is the actual print that was shown in the exhibition, we can sort of work backwards to determine what kind of decisions. Uh, we can work backwards to, to tell what kind of decisions Nerlinger was making when he chose to frame and mount a print for an exhibition versus the kind of uh, way that he would have printed it for illustrated press. Um, for instance, did he retouch? Did he print it on a heavyweight paper? Is it cropped? Um, these questions we can, we can add to um, the determination that it was the actual print that was exhibited and learn more about the objects that are in our possession. Moving further through the object page, um, we get to the surface. Um, and this page shows us all of the methods of analysis and description that we gathered about the actual surface of the photographic paper. Um, and here we see a, here we see a computer synthesized um, image of the surface of the page, which I will show you later on a video of exactly how these are made. And moving further into it, there's a magnified view of the actual paper texture. So you can see uh, variations in the prints based on the photographer's um, manual manipulation of the print or the papers he chose. Um, the fourth tab, paper material, takes you deeper into the actual print, um, showing you uh, tests like UV fluorescence, which helps um, scientists date a print, uh, the paper of a print, um, as well as um, these X-ray fluorescent spectrography graphs, um, which, are, which were really special and were actually really new to most of the curators um, and conservators working on this project because this type of analysis is very rarely applied to photographs. Um, and it's mostly applied to paintings to determine the chemical compositions of the materials used in a painting. But here we applied it to photographs with the intention that if we can create a uh, if we can create an empirical way of presenting or representing the components of the paper, these papers in this collection can be empirically compared to papers of photographs in other collections. So these sorts of empirical data measurements allow us to compare these photographs with others. Only after we've moved through the print as a material object, we get to information about the context, about the historical publications it was featured in, about the historical exhibitions that it was shown in, um, as well as the artist and sitter information. Um, as I mentioned, these nodes and this matrix of connections between artists, um, here at the bottom, there's a section called related links, and that's where any node that this particular photograph is related to is listed. Um, before, before I go much deeper into um, the, the related links and the, the matrix nodes, um, I just want to touch on a few things, which are that uh, a lot of, some of the cataloging in this website is presented in the book, um, the provenance, um, the recto images, um, the marks and inscriptions, 
but um, the majority of it is only available online, and that's part of the benefits of putting this information online and building a website, is that um, you would never have been able to, we would never have been able to present XRF graphs um, for 341 collections in um, a book that is already 400 pages. Uh, so and I'd also like to say um, that because all of this information is online and it's machine readable, um, it can be searched by anyone at any time. So if, for instance, someone is interested in a certain uh, collector or in a certain stamp, all of those things are transcribed um, and can be found if someone has no idea that they're looking for these photographs. But if they search on Google for that information, these will pop up as well. These detail pages are all powered in large part by a database, which um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the museum system, TMS. Um, and it's not, generally, it's not generally used as an online information publishing platform, um, but we made it work for this website. Um, and it was actually one of the most challenging and complex parts, but possibly one of the most fun also, um, was taking, taking, essentially taking all of the research that we had and finding ways to break, to break what could be the foundations of an essay into atomized data that would fit into fields in a database um, with connecting tables um, and attributes and using as little free text as possible. Um, this was a, as I mentioned, this was a really crucial part of sort of making a database driven digital research platform. Um, but it also brought up a number of questions about how you fit a really subjective um, historical record into a database, which is something that I think we can talk about more in the question and answer, answer session, um, because there, there are a number of subjectivities and ambiguities about the actual historical record that are difficult to fit with um, the sort of explicit structure of a database. Um, additionally, we can ask, if, if we know that the end goal of research is to put it into a database, how can we structure our research when we're gathering it to fit that um, to fit that goal rather than an essay? How does our how does our research gathering change to fit um, database entry instead of essay writing, or both? Um, returning to the matrix and the nodes and the related links, um, one of the goals of the project was to combine this database structure with. Um, the approach of a curator who values certain photographs as sig particularly significant in the context of the era. And this returns us to this matrix. Um, so here, if we click on Film and Photo, which was one of the most important exhibitions of the era, um, we can see, we see information about where it traveled, um, installation photos, uh, and some related publications. We can also see that there were about 15 Walter collection photographs that were in this exhibition, um, which sort of makes it interesting to imagine if Thomas Walter was collecting based on, um, based on a desire to recreate a certain circulation or, um, or community of photographs that were, that, were, um, that were being exchanged in the 1920s. We can also see that there were almost 40 Walter artists um, in the film and photo exhibition, which is a huge number comparatively um, from most of the rest of the exhibitions that I found um, that these artists participated in. Um, and at the top, um, two of the organizers are Ella Sitsky and Laszlo maholy Naj, who I'll just sort of highlight their narrative for the rest of the walkthrough of this website. Um, if we go to, this is Ella Sitsky's artist page, which as I mentioned, the artist pages are sort of the other half of the building blocks of the website. But there's the object pages and the artist pages. Um, and there's biographic information in these four tabs. But also, if we click here, um, we can see his life events mapped um, according to time and location. Um, and this might be one of my favorite features, which is that if you press play, it animates according to, you can see him being born in Moscow, and then as he becomes more active, you see his activity in Weimar, in Germany. And because we are in Hungary, I'll also add uh, Laszlo maholy Naj. And he has a 
he had events in America as well. So if we zoom out to include those two, we can, we can play both of their lives um, unfolding at the same time. Um, this actually, as a, as a sort of note, this was one of the programming these artist chronologies or entering the data for these artist chronologies into our database was possibly one of the, um, it was the longest uh, task that I had at the museum. It took, it took two months possibly of full-time work to enter. There were about 3,000 events in total. Um, there are 150 artists and anywhere from 20 to 80 or 90 events per artist, and each one has a name, a location, a date, and attributes that help you, for example, filter um, to see education, events, exhibitions, etc. cetera. Uh, but that was actually one of the most sort of interesting things about fitting what, w what could otherwise be a biography in a book into data was transforming, um, transforming a biography into spreadsheets and then that into a database from there. So we'll move on to the next visualization, um, which is on the poster. Uh, and this is, this is actually the one where we really see the matrix and the network connections at play the most. Um, around the ring of the circle are each one of the nodes, the key influential exhibitions, publications, cities, and schools that I mentioned. Um, and if you click on a node, you'll see, well, that's a monograph, so there's only one artist related to it. Um, if you click on a node, you'll see the artists from the Walter collection who participated in that node. Um, so for instance, I clicked on, I'll unclick. I clicked on Photo Alga, which is a book um, from 1929 um, that was published in conjunction with Film and Photo. And we see that a handful of artists from the Walter collection were in this. If we roll over an artist, we see the rest of their connections in this matrix. Um, you may be familiar with the, the the diagram that was also made for Inventing Abstraction, which was an exhibition at MoMA um, the year before. Um, and that, that attempted to sort of recreate Alfred Barr's diagram of abstraction, but with people and with ideas of network communications. Here, we're doing sort of another, this is another way of representing um, a network of communication during um, photographic modernism. Um, so each one of these nodes has, each one of these nodes was selected as a as a really important influencer in the era, and the artists who participated in it were likely exchanging ideas through this sort of meeting point. So I selected Photo Alga. Um, I'll also select Es Klump der Neue Photograph, which was another book published in conjunction with the exhibition, um, and then Film and Photo itself. And because we're here, I'll select Budapest, um, as well as Moscow, which was Lisitsky's birthplace. Um, and then two other exhibitions that um, happened in Germany around the time of film and photo, photo montage and photo der Gegenwart. And finally, Sovetsko Photo, which I mentioned in the beginning was one of these key publications. Um, so the artists that you see in the center here, including Lisitsky, who we started with, um, are the ones who would have connections to some of these nodes around the circle. Indicates the number of connections. Mm -hmm. um, so this Max Penson didn't have very many within this network diagram, but Lisitsky has plenty. Lisitsky and Maholi Naj, I think, have some of the most, um, and Andre Kertes has some of the most in this collection. Um, there's Maholi Naj, and Herbert Beyer also has quite a few. So just as we've used these diagrams to explore connections between artists, we can also use um, another visualization to explore connections that photographs made. Here we have um, the mapping photographs visualization, which is uh, best zoomed in. Um, if we, we see each of the 341 photographs plotted on a map, if we zoom into Europe, we see where all of the negatives were made. Um, and we roll over certain cities. The larger the circle, again, the, the more photographs were made there. 
So in Berlin, 62 photographs out of the 341 were made. Um, in Paris, there are also quite a few. Uh, in Moscow, there are number 13. Um, if we filter by, I actually want to reset. Um, if we filter, sticking with the same um, exhibition by film and photo, we see that there are 15 Walter photographs. And viewing those, we can see that they were made around Europe and Moscow. And seven of them, seven of the photographs that were in film and photo that are in the Walter collection were made in Berlin. And I will once again return to motorcycle in the race. Um, and to take us to our last visualization, uh, I'll see the techniques that were used in making this photograph. Um, this visualization is, is actually one that um, took a while to develop and, and I think is maybe one of the achievements of this project that um, this is, it, it starts out as a bit complex, but then um, it's actually a way of representing each one of the materials and techniques that the, the conservators were able to analyze um, and pick out from the photographer's methods. So on the left side, we see here attributes are each one of the materials and techniques. And each one of these red dots represents a photograph that matches that attribute, that, that is an abstraction, um, that, sh that has retouching, that is a photogram. And if you roll over an object, you can see that a corresponding dot in another row may get larger. And that means that that object has multiple attributes. So here, this radio dot shows us, this radio dot shows us motorcycle in the race, and you can pick out that it has all of the attributes that are listed here. Um, if you wanted to narrow this down to see just a certain subset, to see which other photographs share the same materials and techniques, uh, well, first, I'll cut out some of the larger categories. And then I'd be interested in, say, retouching, because this is an exhibition print. So there's extensive retouching on it. It's also an abstraction and a photogram. Every time that I add another, every time that I select another attribute from this list, the other photographs in the collection that match that attribute will stay highlighted in teal. So in this case, with the three that I've selected, there's actually only one other photograph in the collection that shares all of those attributes, which is Luigi Veronese's composition from 1935. To give viewers a better understanding of what each of these materials and techniques refers to, they are all defined in the materials reference, which is a vast part of the website and actually re also represents one of the main achievements of this. Um, there's a very clear descriptions of the methods of analysis that not only our con conservation scientists use, but also the photographers were using when they made these prints. So it begins with a glossary of each one of the techniques that can be used as a reference even outside of this collection um, in teaching and in other research. And it goes further into the surface analysis, of which there were about four tests that were conducted on each photograph, beginning with the sort of basic human observation and a description of the method so that it can be repeated at any institution, um, as well as something that was um, uh, called PTM, um, polynomial texture mapping, which I will now play a video of. Hi, my name is Leanne Dapner, and I'm the conservator of photographs at the Museum of Modern Art. Today we're going to look at Alexander Rodchenko's dive photograph using polynomial texture mapping, otherwise known as PTM. This photograph was taken in 1934 or 1935 and printed shortly thereafter. This print is in very fragile condition, but by using this PTM software, we can examine the condition concerns without having to handle the print. We're looking at the edges and we see many creases and tears. Let's change the lighting a little more severely and look at the interior where we see many handling dents. Mostly these dents are crescent-shaped creases here and here. That's where people have handled the paper a little too vigorously, leaving impressions. We can zoom in and look at these light, thin lines where Rodchenko took a very sharp etching knife or a razor, and he carefully scratched away thin slivers of the emulsion. You can see here how he's done that in the highlight areas to enhance that area that would otherwise be lost in the shoulder. This is characteristic of many Rodchenko's photographs, lots and lots of retouching. 
Let's switch to specular enhancement mode, the mathematical manipulation of the numeric data that creates a digital image and generates an exaggerated topography of the surface. The result may not be exactly analogous to the photograph, but it does enhance the features and we see things that we might not see otherwise. These bubbles are an example. This area in the emulsion has been traumatized, perhaps by handling or in a manufacturing flaw, and has resulted in separation of the emulsion and underlying support layers. This print is probably made on Soviet-produced paper, and we have read of photographers complaining that these papers were flawed and problematic, and we think this is an actual example of this condition concern. This work had been varnished with a DeMar varnish, and so the cracks you see here are in that layer, and they reflect light differently. Because of the separating emulsion along with the cracks and tears along the edges, we do not want to handle this work, and we may not recommend travel. Fortunately, the PTM software allows us to examine it repeatedly without touching it. One of the advantages of the PTM is that you can look at different photographs side by side and make comparisons without actually having to have the artifact in front of you. This is great for fragile works of art, which we can't handle, but it's also a wonderful opportunity to share our PTMs and our observations with colleagues at other institutions. And to give you an idea of how those, those videos were constructed, um, these, these two photographs here on the left um, show the machine that a photograph was put under. And at intervals of time, each light would go off. There are something, um, I think around 40 lights, and they each go off. And then the photographs are um, put together digitally to make the video that shows as if a light is sort of being cast over the photograph. So that, as Leanne, the conservator, was explaining, um, you don't have to handle the photograph to see actually what the surface and the status of the photograph are. And there are some more surface imaging tests as well. Um, and in the material analysis section, there are about four other tests that we conducted um, to sort of analyze and once again empirically describe photographs so that they can be compared across collections. And in the section on fiber thickness, we include a worksheet so that um, people at other institutions can download this and try to map the, the fiber contents of their photographs similarly. So once again, these tests can be duplicated and compared across um, institutions. Object Photo aims to provide information in a way that not only extends and fills in the historical record, but also inspires new research by using digital tools that um, allow you to see relationships in different ways. Um, in many industries, if we look around, this is being done very innovatively. Commercially, Google, Amazon, eBay, Facebook have all completely revolutionized the way that we expect to receive information online and how much access we expect to have. Um, in the humanities, there are also a few projects I'd like to point out that are doing this really well and that we took a lot of inspiration from. Uh, one of these is Mapping the Republic of Letters at Stanford University. In each of the visualizations that they've created, we see here um, a mapping of Voltaire's correspondence with writers during the Enlightenment, so his letters to them and their letters to him. Um, and the, the thing that we really liked about this website was that there are three different ways to visualize the same set of data. There's a map, there's a bar chart with timelines, and then you can also sort of filter the, the letters based on the gender of the sender, their nationality, or whether they, uh, what industry they were in, uh, letters and sciences, um, state officials, elite, military, professionals. And each time that you click on one of these factors, it changes the visualizations above it. So they all dynamically interact with each other and respond to each other. Also, we were really interested in Yale University's Photogrammer website. Um, here we see a plotting of all of the hundreds of thousands of photographs in the FSA archive, which is the Farm Security Archive. The Farm Security Administration was a government-sponsored initiative in the United States during the 1930s Great Depression to photograph um, parts of America. It gave photographers work, and it also created a historical record of what America looked like at that time. Um, so with this, it, they began with um, the Library of Congress has all of this metadata about its hundreds of thousands of photographs online, but there was all in individual pages, and you couldn't really compare across photographs. So the researchers at Yale downloaded all of the metadata and mapped it, cleaned up the data quite a bit, and mapped it, 
and plotted it here. And you can narrow down the map according to the time that you're interested in or the specific photographer that you're interested in. Um, one thing I know that sort of began this inquiry for them was they were trying to determine whether FSA photographers were targeting specific demographics or whether they were actually avoiding demographics that may not have looked as good for the historical record. Uh, one way that they began answering this question was by, let's see, actually I want to change this map to the other view. One way they began answering this question was by plotting all the photographs on a map and then overlaying a highway map from the era. It's a bit slow, but it should be loading. Well, even without the actual highway map on there, you can see that certain photographers were following well-set routes, Route 66, other major highways. And that in fact, photographers weren't necessarily getting um, as far away from the beaten path as we might have expected for a project like this. That in fact, they were staying pretty close to well-traveled paths. Um, just to also give you an example, this is, a, this is one of the most well-known photographs from the FSA archive. One other group that I'd like to mention that I think is doing this kind of work really well and that also is addressing the question of how to pay for this sort of work um, is Artifacts Press, which is a for-profit digital, digital online, online catalog resume project. Um, and they, they offer their software as a service to artists and gallerists and estates to um, create digital catalog resumes that can be updated um, can be accessible anywhere and that are uh, complete with images, video, text, and organization um, with visualizations. Um, today, in so many ways, we're accustomed to moving between media, um, to finding information both online and in print. Um, and as artists are also moving fluidly and easily between media, I think it's important for institutions and for us as researchers to be ready to do the same. Um, to sum up some of the benefits of digital resources that I've already sort of spoken about, um, I will go back to the slide. In a nutshell, some of these um, benefits are the flexibility, the ability to sort of recombine your research, to, um, to query it, to filter it, to aggregate it, and find new conclusions. In addition, access is a huge benefit of digital resources, that someone doesn't have to necessarily be near an exhibition or they don't have to have access to a limited run of catalogs or books. Um, it's also a record of the moving image and new media, which are much harder to archive with print. Digital resources are searchable and can be updated, and they have far fewer space limitations than traditional print media. So this, this, asks, this begs the question, how can we as artists, researchers, um, museum professionals um, take advantage of the internet's potential to improve the historical record and increase access to it? And for institutions, I think this means um, at, the very, at the very beginning level to put databases online so that researchers can search it and can, and can find out about what you have in your collections and go to your collection to study it further. Um, for artists and gallerists, I think this also means a huge effort in putting um, information on the web, putting CVs, pictures, text, videos. Um, and though this seems to be standard practice, there are actually huge gaps in the contemporary historical record that's online. Um, but it makes you wonder, if someone is researching internationally, how else should they be gathering that information if they can't, if they can't come to an artist's studio and do a studio visit? Um, I, don't, I don't think that we should underestimate the reality that many people will encounter our work first online, and the more thorough um, and in-depth that information is, um, the, the, more, the more that a researcher can take away from it and can learn about someone's work. The Cambridge Center for Digital Humanities defines three phases of digital humanities. Um, the first phase prioritized the digitization of analog research. So making these records available online is even searchable catalogs or, or um, databases. The second phase includes the growth of a digital humanities discipline so that people can know how to use these tools. The third phase, which is upcoming either now or in the future, um, requires new forms of understanding that will use these technologies to create new forms of research. This prompts the questions, 
what are the advanced long-term goals that we should keep in sight when we begin digitizing information? How can we plan ahead for these future presentations of information online that go beyond the digital catalog? How do we also build an audience that wants to use these digital resources to conduct research? And how do we educate and prepare users to take advantage of them? How do we structure our research gathering so that we're preparing for the end goal of putting it online? Who is also responsible for initiating, managing, and funding these programs? Is it institutions? Is it, is it museums? Is it publishers? Is it universities? Um, even within institutions, who's responsible for these programs? And one way we can begin to answer these questions is to ask what each of us actually wants out of digital resources. What would be useful for your own work? What do you want to be able to find online? As I near the conclusion, um, I want to bring us back to Oscar Nerlinger's Motorcycle in the Race um, and to bring the conversation back to the object, which is at the heart of artistic research. Um, as I, was, I recently gave my pitch about digital humanities to a friend, um, he responded that uh, why should photographers be urged to <clears throat> put information online now if they've been printing in books for so long? And I think hidden within that question is a sort of fear um, and distrust of the in internet and antagonism towards digital technologies. And it's not, it's not dissimilar to the debate between digital and analog photography as well. But I think if we take a step back, we should sort of reconsider our relationship to the internet. It doesn't have to be a medium that consumes other media. It can be a media that works in tandem and in correspondence with print and exhibition. Here we see um, the visitor statistics for the Thomas Walter Collection website. Um, as I mentioned, in December, the website was launched at the same time as a book and as the exhibition. Um, I was so pleased to see these Google statistics yesterday because they showed me that, um, in fact, there are many people who are going to MoMA to the exhibition to see the prints in person, and the sales of the books are very high. But also, people in everywhere from Guadeloupe to Qatar to Finland um, and Morocco are able to view this same collection and different information about it online, and in a way that sort of meets them as a digital viewer and tailors the experience to their viewing conditions. So um, as a conclusion, um, just also um, would like to say thank you for inviting me and thank you also for open minds about, your open minds about um, what digital resources can contribute to art history and to the study of it. Thank you. Um, well, this also this goes back to the question about who who is responsible for for pursuing digital humanities. Which um, at the time, I think a lot of universities are actually doing some of the best work in digital humanities right now, and that's partly because of funding structures, but also partly because of the huge bodies of people and researchers that they have on hand to do this work. Um, and I think I think when you when you said this sort of when you brought up the antagonism towards digital tools. Um, Something I, I wanted to mention also is that digital tools seem to remove this time-space dimension that's critical to a work's conception, to its realization, um, and to its reception. Um, but in fact, I think the way I see digital humanities, and I think what this collection proves, um, is what this website proves is that digital humanities aren't meant to replace the physical. They're meant to, they're meant to actually add on another layer of information that wouldn't be easy to access in an exhibition, or that could also 
um, that could also inspire someone to go back to the object, to give them information about where that object exists or, or whether it fits into their sort of research or to be inspired by it and to then find that object in a museum's collection and go back to it. Um, so I think, I think the antagonism is, is, um, can be addressed in that way. Um, and and it's, it's a mix, I think, of um, who's doing it is a mix of museums and universities and also this, the Artifacts Press, I think, presents an interesting option for how we finance these projects too. Um, so perhaps it's also for-profit companies. question then that it looks all perfect and fantastic this multi-layer views what was the process of testing it so when was it launched for a subset of testers and did it change much um well actually if um there were, there were a lot of internal tests and we reviewed it with people we tried to review it with a large group of a large range of um, professionals, so people who were conservators and who knew these tests well and could determine whether this display of the scientific information was accurate and was legible, um, as well as curators and teachers, um, and then also people who didn't have as much familiarity with the history of photography, to try to make sure that in some way that there were layers of this project that could reach people at various levels of expertise. Um, and much of that was internal. Um, and. Perhaps if I, if I were to do this project over again, I would probably give more time for iterations to, to build, to be able to incorporate user feedback into a Walter website 2.0 or 3.0, which maybe, maybe will happen. But, um, but, that, but that is, I think that that's a huge part of digital humanities. And I see that also with um, the Photogrammer website, that when I first actually learned about the Photogrammer website was at a beta session for them. And the website looked very different than it does now. And, through feedback, they have really improved it over the last year and, and two years and made it um, tripl tripled or quadrupled um, its effectiveness as a resource. So that's, that's certainly a factor to consider. Um, and we did it mostly internally, but, but I think opening it up to a broader audience could be helpful also. Did you feel like um, when creating this website database that it kind of, um, or what impact do you think it had on the multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary dialogue within people that are interested in these photographs? And obviously lots of people from all di different disciplines were there and this is the definitely sort of opportunity to do any of that. Um, well, actually, the, the thing that stands out to me most about interdisciplinary dialogue was there were, there were sort of two parts. Um, there was the dialogue between curators and conservators, um, which this project was actually funded and initiated in an attempt to make conservators or make, make that information come together in new ways um, to really merge the historical record with the material analysis. Um, and, that, and that actually was probably one of the richest collaborations that I think we all experienced over time. Like I met. I learned a lot about um, material analysis and conservation through trying to understand the, the conservation content and how you break that up and present it online. And I would have several hour long meetings with the conservation team to sort of understand what a PTM is, like as in that video, and what each of these tests represent. Um, and then the other, the, other, um, the, the other collaboration that was particularly fruitful was also working with developers um, and how you how you talk to um, uh, content strategists, um, statisticians, geographers, um, user experience designers about art history and sort of that give and take between um, our, our knowledge of, of how of the richness of this content and, and what we wanted to users to see. And they were approaching it without that historical background. But, but in some ways, they were our, sort of our first users to test it because they, they also, if they didn't understand what they were presenting, then, um, then we went back to the drawing board and, and tried to re, um, uh, reteach and to re-explain sort of what the emphasis in the con this content was. And coping with this stuff, it's just so the entire museum. <laughs> um, 
Um, it was, it, it differed. There were, we actually used, we, so many departments in the museum helped in so many ways. Um, as for as for staff that was hired specifically for this project, um, there was a, a full-time associate curator, a senior curator, a research assistant, um, myself, who I started as the cataloger and became the digital content strategist. Um, there was a, a sort of publication coordinator who gathered all of the image and copyright um, information. And we also had a, a team of rotating interns um, who are excellent. Um, in conservation, that was just in the curatorial department. Um, and in conservation, there was a full-time conservation scientist who was dedicated to this collection, um, as well as two people who um, worked on it and consulted on it. And we had several pe uh, people from digital media department as well. Um, we had an editor from the publications department, uh, two editors actually, um, and then at Second Story, um, which is, which is external to MoMA, um, there were about four people who weren't working on it full time, but um, were, were committed to this project. And actually, um, now that I mentioned the editor, that's also one of the things that um, I should mention as something that if I, if I were to do this again, there's, um, oh wait. In the, typical, in the typical publication workflow for a print publication, there's a very clear um, process that it goes through. There's an author, and then it goes through a designer and an editor and a proofreader onto the printer. Um, and that's a, that's a very set thing. But for making a website like this that functions as a digital publication, um, those, that workflow I, I don't think is as, um, as set or as established as it is with print publications. And so um, we, we, had, we had the excellent help of two um, editors at MoMA who really, I think, raised the bar on this to make it, to, to standardize the hundreds of thousands of words on this um, website to make sure that there was an even tone, an even style, um, and that it read as an authoritative scholarly publication. Did, did you or anybody make some uh, estimation of the type of work? So because that's a common thing that it's all very difficult and very expensive to turn things mm -hmm. into digital or to apply mm -hmm. digital te te technologies. So can, do you have some rough estimate that all the costs which were much. That was What's not revealed to me. <laughs> not revealed to me, but um, it, the budget was not revealed to me. But I do know that in terms of time, it was four years gathering this research. But the concept, conceptualizing the website began um, in, as I said, in, in sort of the summer and fall of 2013, and we began work on it approximately a year before we launched. A year, a year and a few months before we launched, um, and um, and that that's also. Um, that was a good amount of time, um, but more time is always helpful with, with publications of this size for iterative testing, sort of receive feedback. And, and what is the general feeling like uh, at MoMA or, or on, on uh, the leader level that are they proud? Do they see it? Glowing. Like you multiply the, the effect of this invested work by having it online too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think people are really happy with it. Um, even even outside of the museum too. Um, well, well, inside of the museum, um, we had a day long symposium when we launched it, and it brought together a number of photography professionals, um, uh, photographers, gallerists, um, printers, um, and, and students, and people who were working in, in technology also. And and that day actually um, was this sort of amazing like charge to go forward with this work because. We had a sort of consensus um, across generations that this work was really opening up new doors and new ways of looking at research and trends, um, and and that was that was an amazing feeling. And I think that that's the way that most of the staff um, who's worked on this and who's encountered the website feels too. And even outside of the museum, um, there's been a lot of really good press on it too. Um, the New York Times ran a review, and and each one of the 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 articles that has covered it has talked about these multiple platforms and has talked about this as, as the exhibition, the, I'm sorry, the website and the book sort of bringing people in to look at the photographs, to, to look at the objects that are then represented online and that have a different layer of information online. Um, and I did see um, when the, the Google statistics guy sent me the numbers, um, I saw that the New York Times article brought in almost 5,000 clicks. Um, 
So I think there's been, there's been a really good feeling, I think, about um, sort of what, what doors this opens up to. 